ใช่ครับพี่เพชรRight. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to um, this meeting of Indian Schools Forum. Um, we are live and on broadcast, so um, we'll begin the meeting. So, item number one: uh, apologies for absence and substitutions. Mm -hmm. So we we have apologies from Susan Dillon and possibly Dave Woods as well he said he might not be able to join but just two apologies yeah great um and just in, in terms of housekeeping could i ask colleagues that are attending virtually if you do want to speak um if you would unmute yourself and turn your camera on when you're speaking so that people will see who's speaking okay so in terms of urgent matters, moving on to item number two, um, I've agreed um, Stefan, one of her colleagues, Stefan from the NEU, uh, has just asked, requested to speak this evening. So over. Thank you, Chair. Um, I wanted to start two, two bits. First bit is why our dispute is your dispute. Um, and then the second bit is asks. Some of the things I'm about to say, you'll know far better than my members, but I'm going to say them anyway because I don't know how to make any other sort of speech. Um, the recruitment and retention crisis of teachers, one in eight leave the profession within the first year of being an ECT. One in three teachers leave the profession within five years. You cannot get a physics or a maths teacher, and I am a physics teacher. Um, they're not just gold dust, they're gold nuggets. Uh, the DfE failed its own targets in trying to recruit primary teachers, uh, people to become primary teachers. Support staff can get better pay and better hours stacking shelves in Sainsbury's or Lidl. The number of food banks in 2010 were in the low hundreds. Now there's tens of thousands of them. The number of children living in poverty as defined by the United Nations has rocketed since 2010. The dispute that we're with with the government is the lack of funding, which I'm not a head teacher and I'm a bit of a slow learner, but for years sitting here listening to you talk about uh, how you're going to divvy up a smaller and smaller pot, I've learned a little bit of it. Basically, you have less and less money to deal with things. And the pay increase for support staff is unfunded. The pay increase for teachers is unfunded. Where are you going to find the money? You're going to make redundancies. Um, and all this impacts and affects children. I think the government is extremely cynical when it talks about vulnerable children, because if they were concerned about vulnerable children, they would fund your schools sufficiently in the first place. So it's about funding. It's the second thing is about pay. So if you were a teacher and you started in 2010 and you were on M1 and you had an increase in pay that matched inflation, your pay would be between 65 and 85,000 pounds more. You'd get a paycheck of, a, of your monthly pay and then a big fat check for 65,000 pounds. That's how much teachers have lost in real money since 2010. Support staff have lost even more. They've lost about 24% of, the, of their wages in real terms, and which is why there is a huge recruitment tension crisis. The American education unions, and they're always very good with their sound bites, have a slogan that I have pinched and used over and over again. 
that the working conditions of my members is the learning environment of the pupils. If it's bad for us, it's bad for the kids. So we're on strike. We've achieved something that the government didn't think was possible. We have 300,000 members, 23,000 schools. Uh, they just didn't think we would overcome uh, these anti-trade union laws. In 2016, 44% in Ealing uh, voted, postal voted for strike action, but about 80 to 85% of my members were shut because all the schools were closed or largely closed. My members were saying, my reps were saying that virtually everyone is out. This time, Ealing got an 83.7% postal turnout and a 95% yes vote. Support staff voted 81.2% with a 90.4% yes vote for strike action. London voted 70% uh, returned their ballot papers and 90 plus percent for strike action. These are huge, huge numbers. And by the way, I'm very proud of my uh, reps because we got the biggest turnout of all the NEU districts in England and Wales. So, you, so please understand the strength of feeling that there is amongst the teachers. But I also know that this strength of feeling is mirrored within your unions. The NHT voted 65% for strike action. 85% or something like that for action, short strike action. We were very keen on one of your ones, which was not to dock our pay when we took strike action. We, we quite like that one. Please, please do that. Uh, but there is one other thing which you don't necessarily need advice. Uh, you don't need action, short strike action to do. And this is where it comes to, an, which is where we come to the ask. Because if our dispute is your dispute, and if we win, schools win, you win. So, you're responsible for the risk assessment and whether you open or close your schools. If you had passed the anti-trade union laws, which I have to say are the worst in Europe, the only country that's got worse anti-trade union laws than Britain is Turkey, and that's not saying much. So if you had passed the anti-trade union laws, you'd be on strike. You are responsible for producing a risk assessment on the day of our strike. My plea, my advice is simple. Just shut the school. It's, it's simple. You, you have that right. You have that decision. Close the school. The government is desperate to keep as, as many schools open as it can. And we're going to shut as many of them as we can. And we're doing this so that our schools can have funding and we can have a decent pay and the recruitment and attention crisis is averted. Because our argument is extraordinarily similar to the uh, NHS and the nurses uh, situation. If we don't win this, then we're going to look like our education system is going to look like what the NHS is looking like at the moment. Uh, there's a lot at stake on this. This isn't that this isn't playing games. We must win. And we would appreciate every little bit of support that you can give us. Shut your schools, please. Thank you. Thanks, Stefan. Okay, so uh, we're going to move on to the main body of the uh, meeting. Uh, matters to be considered in private, there are none. Declarations of interest? No? Okay, the minutes of the previous meeting, which was in November. So I will. Hopefully, people have got the minutes in front of them. So we'll just go through quickly, page by page. Um, first page, which is around attendance. Second page, which begins the schools forum report. Any issues? The next page. Any issues with regards to the minutes? In the next few pages, do with the discussions around the um, schools for uh, the report, um, and then the last page really deals with the resolutions. Happy to agree the minutes. Yep. Okay. So we're agreed, and I'll sign every page for me. Okay, so we need to move on to membership, and there are a couple of issues around membership that are coming up. Um, 
we have a number of vacancies, a few vacancies, and also a couple of term of office expirations. So there will be a nomination election process initiated probably, I think, in March time, Cornelia. Um, so it's important that sectors and, and groups um, put forward nominees for um, these vacancies. Uh, so any, anything else, Cornelia, on the vacancies or that's it, but um, it, the process will begin in March and we need to get, we are hoping to get it resolved and membership agreed for the next forum meeting, which is in early May. So that the forum is as full as possible. Okay. Is the process the same for uh, sitting members who wish to stand again? Do they need to be re-nominated and go through the same process or is there a different process? Yes, it's the same process. You need to be re-nominated. Okay. Um, and, and just to say, so if the number of nominations exceeds the number of, of vacancies, then there would need to be an um, election in that instance. So it depends on how excited people are to join the Schools Forum. But at least if we could have some nominations, that would be helpful. And even renominations. Yeah. At least four. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it would be four for the primary maintained sec sector, yeah. Great, so we move on to the main body of the report, um, which hopefully is going to be straightforward enough tonight as um, a, lot, a number of the issues were picked up in the last forum report and in the pre-meeting. Over to Kim or Tamara. Sorry, first of all, Charles. I think Tamara's going to introduce. So. Oh, Tamara and then Charles. Thanks, Paul. Um, so as Paul said, the, pur the purpose of um, the January meeting is to make any final decisions in advance of setting budgets for both schools and the local authority um, for the next financial year. So the report sets out the allocations to the Ealing local authority and how um, those budgets are proposed to be allocated. Um, there are some decisions in respect of the early years block um, following a consultation after the last uh, school forum meeting which Charles will take us through and then um, items for noting around allocations for mainstream schools and budgets for next financial year decisions around de-delegations and then items for noting around the high needs block so I'll hand over to Charles who will take us through the early years recommendations yeah thanks Tamara um so yeah, I'll just take you through as an overview. Um, so we consulted with schools early as providers in October 22, as we're required to do, um, around different elements of our formula. Overall, the structure of the formula um, based on the feedback will stay the same. The consultation responses that we got um, were very supportive of the current formula. The only areas which were slightly lower um, were uh, we, we, we in Eden we put five percent mandatory. We're required to have a supplement for deprivation, and we put the maximum amount five percent to that. Um, you can see in the report that on, only fifty three percent. That was the lowest um, return uh, in terms of support on an element. I'd need to kind of unpick that more, but it's um, the rest was very um, you know very supportive of the current formula. So it might be that um, some of the uh, consultees overall feel that they lose out on that element of funding. So maybe less deprived um, schools or providers, um, it's probably providers were um, part of that uh, feedback. Um, in terms of how the budget's set nationally, um, there's quite a lot of technical issues behind how they set the budget. The biggest one for Elin is that um, I said it earlier in um, it was 2015, it was actually 2017. Um, the formula was set based on the free school meal um, level of deprivation in Elin, and they've now updated that. And that's 
caused um, a, a good uplift for us because um, sadly the number of uh, children in Elim who are eligible for free school meals has risen as a proportion in that time. Um, there are other technical issues around the disability living allowance and how that is set and the area cost adjustment as well. So overall Elim um, got more funding in, which is good. Um, there's, when we look at um, that, that's set out in table one um, in terms of, of how that comes in. So we, as I said, the, the consultation in October was very supportive of the current structure of how we proportion that money out to schools and providers. Um, and we will continue to use the same factors in how we um, put the money out in terms of the three and four year old funding and the two year old funding. Um, there was support, again, very strong support for our retention of the 5% funding, which um, uh, we're allowed to do nationally. Um, and in table three, it sets out how we use that funding. So um, again, happy to take any questions when we get to the end around that. Um, but the elements that are key to that is the support for the Family Information Service, which helps make sure that the take up of three and four year old funding and two year old funding is high. And for Elin in the community, that's really important because if we don't get the take up of things like the two year old offer, the impact on the money we get in as a local authority is um, much lower and it runs into millions um, if we don't get the take up high. So in the pandemic, when the take up dropped off, we saw quite a big impact. So the actual funding rates are set out in table four. Um, so the funding, that, the additional funding we get in, we're proportionately sending out to schools and providers. Uh, this is a, an element for schools. Um, they are now putting in the teacher pay and pension grant through the formula, which they hadn't done before. Um, we consulted with you around whether you wanted that as a lump sum or whether you wanted that pro rata um, based on headcount over the year. You've come back with lump sum. So that's what we're going to do. And that's 15 pound, 15 pence. It'd be great if it was 15 pounds, 15 pence per hour per headcount child. Two year old funding, very straightforward. All the money we get in, we send out to you. Um, and it's 629 rise into 6.92. Thanks, Kim. I saw your body language there. Have I got it wrong? Yeah, so currently 6.29 uh, and rise into 6.92. Uh, so disability access funding, uh, important again that we publicise to families so that they can draw down that funding and we rely on schools and providers to um, support parents to know that they are eligible um, and we also where we can and we have other professionals involved with families we highlight that they are eligible for that funding and again that's all passed through to um, the families. Um, the contingency has set the same as we have done in past years um, which we felt was prudent and we've called on that because of the way that the headcount is funded and we are in quite a, um, we're in a position of falling headcounts. So we need to have a contingency set aside to manage that effectively. The inclusion fund, um, we know that schools providers have seen a real impact of the pandemic on young children and there is strong support for continuing with the proportion of funding that we put through um, SCN and inclusion. When we look at it, as a proportion for other authorities, we're relatively high on that, but we feel that um, that's the right place to be in terms of the need that we're seeing come into the system. Um, finally, uh, we invested more money um, through the Contained Outbreak Management Fund, and we would like that um, to continue. We've seen the impact of that, and there are two changes there which will help us um, fund that going forward uh, within existing budgets. We are um, suggesting that we cap uh, funding for children in need to £10 per hour. Most providers fall um, within that. There is a, a couple that don't, but we're going to cap it to £10. 
um, as we think that's fair. And we're also going to look at the duration of funding. At the moment, we fund children in need funding usually up to um, when they're in provision. Often uh, children are not on a statutory plan um, for that long. And we're actually going to look at um, reviewing that and bringing it down to in line with uh, two terms, which again, we feel is fair. Uh, and that will enable other vulnerable children to, to receive that funding in, in, in terms of children with SCN particularly. So that is a whistle top tour of that but if i'm happy to take any questions um so i just if i just clarify in the rec and the recommendations so most of it, that is for is for noting and commenting the bit that requires a decision is around the centrally retained level of the early years block so keeping that at the five percent is the bit we require for them to to vote on uh, anybody have any questions about the early years funding jeremy Thank you. Just, um, and I apologize that I, that I missed part of the, 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 the pre-meeting. It's just looking at it quickly, it seems like core school improvement functions for maintained schools are the, the, the de-delegation, you know, sits in at around 235,000 um, pounds, but in the early years quality improvement, it's nearly double that amount. And I'm just wondering why, why that might be. Yeah, thanks, Jeremy. So for this element, we are required to cover um, child mind in private, voluntary, independent and schools within that quality improvement grant. There's a buyback element. So we encourage buyback and there is a bit of income generation. But there's also um, it, it's quite a, a diverse and large group. Um, of, of, of settings and providers within the early years sector and there's quite a lot of risk in there so for example we have a fluctuating population of child minders it's currently dropping at the moment um, but it's sort of had, over the years it's fluctuated between 500 down to 300 so it's quite a lot of scope in terms of um, the need to reach and make sure that the quality is appropriate uh, on that offer Again, in the private voluntary independent sector, about 106 providers, and then we've got all the schools. So it is, it's quite a lot of reach um, within that, that quality improvement element. Um, but yeah, it's a fair point, um, but we, we, we've set it at that level because we feel it's a fair balance around risk and, um, and uh, yeah, being able to reach that number of providers. But yeah, hope, hopefully that answered it. Yeah, and just for clarity's sake, the 5% centrally retained budget isn't out of schools money. It's just from government money that you're, you know, asking us permission to keep, but it's not like it's coming out of the pockets of schools. Is that correct? Yeah, so sorry, I pick that up. So, um, yeah, this is from the early years block rather than the schools block funding. And the early years block funding has to cover child minding um, all providers in the sector, but schools are part of that. So um, there is an element that goes to schools, so it does impact schools. Um, but yeah, but, but that, for all the reasons I've set out, that's why it's been set at 5%. When we looked at the consultation, um, there was, you know, there's a high level of support for um, that. So um, it's 80% responses that we had in. So. It's, it seems to be again quite a support. People feel that the services offered there um, support the sectors. Could I just ask Charles? Um, there are no issues in the area around inspection of early years or child minding, or that have caused any concern over this path over the period. Yeah. Um, Yes, there have been concerns because there's such a big sector. So we have, um, and that's the risk that we we have in this sector. So um, we've had, um, yeah, a few incidences of providers where um, they've suddenly gone inadequate from previously being good. And we've had a few whistleblown cases with childminders and the private voluntary independent sector as well. So it's quite a, as I said, it's a, there's a lot um a lot of people decide that they are going to enter into this business so that they're, they're, 
you know, there, there needs to be a bit of a grip around the quality. It's important, I think. Any other questions for Charles on this issue? Just, uh, I mean, what are we doing right now then? Because it looks like this year's budget is zero. So how, what, what is, where's the money now? Yeah, so I, I think it's a presentational issue, Jeremy, rather than a, a suggested change in provision of the service. So we're not going from no service to a new service that's funded at that level. Um, so I think um, if forum members are comfortable, we can provide an update around some of the detail on that for the next forum meeting. There aren't any radical changes in the application of the 5%. It's it's kind of cut in the same way. I think it's a technical budgety thing on our side, which hasn't entirely been kind of helpful in this conversation. Okay, if there are no other uh, questions or comments, it's, should we just carry on with the report or agree the thing as we go along? Really as we go along. Yeah, so. so in terms of number two, agree the centrally retained level of the early years block of 5% is permitted. Is everybody okay with that? Agreed? Okay, agreed. Thanks, Charles. We'll come back to you later. <laughs> um, so moving on to the schools block and central school services block and just to add that it should the notation should be four five six seven but we'll correct that over to kim okay hi everyone um so on the schools block and central service box on the schools block first so the um, recommendations are around noting the value of the schools block and the budgeted commitments and noting the indicative allocations to individual schools budgets, which are set out in Appendix 1 and the funding formula factors to propose to be used in 23-24, which is set out in Appendix 2. Um, so turning to page, bottom of page 19 of the papers, um, so there were a number of decisions that um, forum members will remember that we made at, at the November meeting. So those are just set out. So that's around the minimum funding guarantee being um, set at zero. The um, agreed transfer of the 0.5% to from schools block to high needs block. So it's now confirmed on the values that the value of that is 1.456 million. Um, and then around the growth fund and and forum also noted that for affordability purposes, final allocations may need to be capped, capital scaled and the formula allocations may need to be um, adjusted and that those adjustments would be made to prior attainment and deprivation factors. So the table um, sets out the schools block grant allocations, which are um, marginally lower than the in indicative values in the November due to a slightly, a slightly lower number of pupils by the time the um, numbers were finalised. And um, appendix, um, so appendix one and two set out those their formula factors and the indicative budget allocations. The um, last year there was a supplementary grant which was um, then rolled into the um, schools block funding formula this year. So the um, difference in total in schools block allocations is sixteen point three million. Um, but the seven point nine four of that last year was the supplementary grant. So the actual um, increase is in in the schools but funding is 8.37 million when you take account of what came through the supplementary grant last year um in terms of affordability so um the the way the funding formula works is there's a there's a lag to um the formula factors which means because we're continuing to see um free school meal rates increasing that um le that leaves an affordability gap when allocating the funding out to schools and um, coupled with the decisions made at, at um, Forum last time around the 0.5% transfer. So those are the key things that have led to a um, affordability gap. The other decisions made by, by, by Forum haven't materially impacted on the gap. So the impact of the minimum funding guarantee is 0%. It's only one school that get affected by that. And it's only um, just under £40,000 now. So it's a very small impact on the overall picture now. Um, and the growth fund allocation is anticipated so the, the amount of the allocation from the government is anticipated to be sufficient to cover the growth requirements in 23-24 so there hasn't been an additional 
top slice, although if there does con- sort of continue to be a higher number of um, arrivals from abroad, that would be a call on contingency in future reserves. So the majority of formula factors um, remain set at the um, national funding formula. All formula factor fests have increased, increased between years, um, but for, for those affordability reasons, the um, deprivations of the free school meal and the F the, F the free school meal six factor and the low prior attainment factors have um and the adarki factors have been adjusted down to the so there's a the formula this year has um a limit to how much so as part of the move towards the national funding formula um there's a limit to how much we can adjust any one formula factor this year of minus 2.5 percent so they've been adjusted to the the limit of where we can adjust them down to um which still left a that that still left a small affordability gap. So the um, proposed rates are are to adjust, make that adjustment through the ORPU, so the age weighted pupil unit, so that that adjustment is then um, spread across schools. So it's a minus 0.25%. So it's a minor adjustment that we um, needed to make to make the formula affordable. There were alternative approaches to that that we we looked at, which included adjusting all the other formula factors down to the maximum allowable but there still would have been required some scaling back of gains if we'd um, done that and it would have disproportionately impacted on schools with the highest levels of deprivation and mobility and also some of the schools with falling roles who've seen some of the largest per pupil gains so we felt that the small adjustment to the ORPU on top of the already agreed adjustments to the um, deprivation and low prior attainment factors was the best way to manage that um that so that's our as um that's our sort of indicative formula it does need to now go through the um esfa for um approval and also for political ratification as well but so those um allocations in the appendices are currently the indicative values but we don't expect any material changes to those um funding outside of the formula um so the key things there to note are that the people premium rates have increased by 5% for 23-24. So um, all for, for the, the range of different things that come under people premium, so for the de- deprivation elements, but also the looked after children and adopted children and service children elements have all seen a 5% increase for 23-24. And then the other bit is the mainstream schools additional grant. So in addition to the schools block funding, in the autumn statement, the DfE um, announced, or the government announced that there would be an additional two billion pounds going into schools um and to to because of cost pressures that weren't um known when the initial allocations were were set um that additional funding in total amounts to 9.74 million across ealing schools so it's slightly more than the supplementary grant equivalent last year it's got a new name this year so it's a mainstream schools additional grant this year to distinguish it from last year's grant but it's a it's a similar thing so it's an additional grant on top of the schools block allocations um and we've so i've um set out on page 22 of the report the factors so it's a there's a per pupil rate a lump sum and a and a free school meal six deprivation rate to that and in appendix one yes one um We've included indicative allocations for um, that grant. So the actual allocations will be published in the in the spring, but we've calculated um, based on the, the the methodology what those um what those look like and they shouldn't materially change from those indicative allocations. Um so I think that's the key things on there. So if we just come to any questions on the schools block bit before we move on to the due delegations. That's a lot to absorb. Um, <laughs> is any questions? As no. ever. Oh, Philip. Yes. Um, um, I, uh, well, as Charles said, one of the bits of missing here, the small bit of good news is the uh, formula being updated on, on, on school meals, particularly and some other areas like the ACA. And that's a credit to the local government and the education sector for its lobbying work it's been doing. That's very much a problem. Hopefully next year we can do some more. Um, I um, was interested in looking at the. Um, uh, I thought interested in looking at the the eating comes out on out eight percent higher uh, earlier, per se, which is striking and not what I would expect in the current climate. Um, in appendix one, I assume the 
in the first instance, the column any of which movement caused by factor changes includes that school mills school mills element, and I hope that's the largest bit. It's striking that that, that column its variations are quite substantial. Um, hundreds of thousands in Greenford, down to about the tens of thousands in certain other areas. Um, I cut back four years ago. I look at this data on the EGFL, and um, it was um, striking that at my school, John Perrin, had the highest eligibility in the borough, and our neighbour East Saxon had had a second highest. Um, but now I know it's we're ten times the the financial amount uh, allocated under this. Um, the, the, the East Saxon. And I'm very pleased to hear that Kim says that we can have new data in uh, February. I think so. Um, very interesting to see if that's uh, that we use it to be um, analysed by school, so we can look fairly easily at creating a league table, which will tell us which schools are higher. So it's very useful data for the de deprivation geography of the borough. Tell us where things are happening that we can't tell from other other things as well. And we eventually relevant for the gate for lo guy for lobbying next year. Any other comments or questions? Okay, shall we move on to G-Delegation? Okay, so on the G-Delegation at the November meeting, um, we agreed to keep the um, for, form agreed to, to retain the contingency at the, at the um, current level and that the we the, to in principle um, to fund the pay awards in the G-Delegation for the um, physical male eligibility, the trade union and trade union facility time and the behaviour, um, primary behaviour service, and that we'd bring the rates for those back to this meeting. Um, it was also noted around the primary behaviour service that the, the, uh, an increase to, to cover the pay award wouldn't be sufficient to maintain the service at the current rate. And um, John um, at that at that point um, committed to go back out for further consultation ahead of this meeting. So if we take each of the D delegations in turn, so we're on page twenty. Where are we? Page twenty three of the report. Um, so around the trade union facility time. So as say forum had resolved to um, fund the current rates. Um, plus an increase to cover the pay award. The local authority bring the actual rate back to this January meeting. So the proposed rates are an increase from 407 to 429 per pupil for primary facility time and an increase from £2.86 um, £2. to £3.2 for the secondary facility time. So those rates are a 5.5% increase, which reflects the um, actual pay awards. So the pay awards being the 5% for teacher representatives because all of the current representatives are at that um the upper pay scale or leadership scale that would have been the five percent increase this year and um the seven between seven and eight percent increase for the non-teaching representatives so non-teaching trade unions receive 13 percent of the total amount that's de-delegated by forum so that 5.5 percent is a um, an increase to reflect the balance between the support staff and the um teaching staff unions and the level of increase um the at the last meeting the representative of staff nominated by recognized trade unions um explained that the number of days paid for by the city time has reduced over the past 10 years even though the membership and demand for services increased and at that stage, Forum resolved that decision about increasing the rate further would be worked through as part of the autumn consultation to inform Forum's decision making regard, regarding the 24-25 rate. So that's a that's a thing to come back to in the autumn consultation. But for, for this meeting and for the 23-24, those um, are the proposed rates. So that's the, um, the vote there. So I don't know if it's best to do that vote now and then we can get into in turn. In terms of the prime, sorry, in terms of the primary school sector, are we happy to agree to 429? Great. Uh, secondary sector? Great. Okay, so we'll move on to the free school meal eligibility. Oh, oh question. And that's, that's uh, just, just a point of information. Um, the NEU in the last four days has grown by 10,000 members and in Ealing NEU the last time I checked which was a couple of hours ago there's now 126 new teachers in the NEU that's a phenomenal growth 
So we are now 3,165 members in Ealing NEU and growing again. Has something happened in this past few days? <laughs> Uh, so moving, sorry, moving on to free school meal eligibility. Um, yeah, so at the last meeting for for resolve to fund the um, FSM eligibility checking at the current rate plus an increase to cover the pay award, and then we bring the rate back to this meeting. Um, the proposed rate is an increase from one pound ninety five per person per pupil to two pound seven, um, and that is a six percent. Um, increase and that reflects the level of the actual pay award for the staff funded by the D delegation. So to vote on that. Sorry, I have my microphone on in time. Um, any, anybody want to make any comment or shall we agree that? Agreed? Agreed? Okay, and then the final D delegation is the primary behaviour support service. So this would be a vote for primary um, representatives. So the the at the November meeting, the representative for um, for um, Pruis explained that um, applying an increase to just to cover the pay award would still leave a funding gap, and committed to consulting further with primary schools via quadrant representatives ahead of this meeting. So there was an information paper circulated to primary schools via quadrants. Um, a couple of weeks ago, in the start, start of January, which set out the forecast and staffing costs for the service. Um, at 0.252 million, um, of which around 0.04 million can be generated as additional income. So leaving a 0.212 million to be fund required to be funded by the D delegation to maintain the current level of staffing. That works out as a D delegation rate of £8.38 per pupil for 23-24, which is an increase of 96p per pupil or 12.9%. Um, and that proposed increase mitigates both against the um, pupil numbers that have fallen in the primary sector and also funds the action projected pay awards that will need to be met in the 23-24 financial year for both the teaching and NHS employed staff funded by that due delegation. Um, and the paper noted that if a lower increase is agreed, the service would need to reduce staffing, which would impact on, on schools and on the waiting times. Um, primary schools were asked to share their responses back to schools forum representatives in their quadrants. And at the time of writing the, the paper um, of the 43 primary schools that have responded, um, all supported increasing the de-delegation funding rate to cover the staffing costs as proposed. Um, okay, thanks Kim. Anybody, any comments or questions about that item? Happy to agree that. Yes, agreed. Okay. okay, so that's the um, schools block items completed. So the next recommendation is around the um, noting the revised central schools services block allocation. So the final, alloc the final allocation is set out in table eight. It's marginally um, different from the um, indicative allocation set out in the November meeting because it's now based on the updated pupil numbers. Um, but it's a, uh, the grants increased from 1.966 to 2.019. So the reason for the increase to remind forum members is because um, free school meals is, is an underlying factor within that allocation. And so the increase in that we've seen in Ealing, which is proportionately higher than the increase seen nationally um, and elsewhere, means that we're Got an increase in the per pupil rates within that. Um, so, and and then the table nine there sets out the um, historic commitments. So, um, these were a, a, the a, the sp split of that historic commitments funding was agreed at the November meeting. So, the final final amounts are set out in that table. Um, so, are there any comments on the central services block? We we'll move on to the high needs block. Okay, so moving on to the high needs block. Um, so the, the first recommendation there is to note the value of the high needs block and the budgeted commitments to that high needs block. Um, and then the second recommendation is around asking officers to report back further on the strategy and financial recovery we plan at the next meeting. So in terms of those allocations, the DfE have confirmed the indicative allocations for the high needs block. 
Um, it's not a final allocation at this stage because the import export part of that um, is currently based on last year's um, patterns. So that will be updated in the final allocation. Um, but the indicative allocation is an increase of um, 6.7 million in total. So that includes the additional pressures funding so in the same way that there's additional pressures funding gone into mainstream schools through the mainstream additional grant, there is some additional funding gone into the high needs block for those um, cost pressures so that totals 3.225 million that additional pressure so it takes the initial growth that was 3.909 million um, so including that 3.225 that gets us to the 6.7 um, that additional cost pressures is it equivalent to a further 4.6% increase to the funding floor than was initially would initially have been part of the, the high needs block? Um, so from that 3.225 allocation, there is a condition on there that local authorities are required to pass on an allocation of 3.4% to special schools. So it's 3.4% per place based on total place and top-up funding. So that's a similar level of increase to. What, main, the, what mainstream schools will have seen through the additional grant. So that's something that will be pass, passed through to um, special schools. And this is on top of the 3% minimum funding guarantee that's um, in place in the, in the required in the top ups this year. So that additional funding, last year, the additional precious funding didn't have any condition on it for the special schools. So that's something that was added into this year's um, additional funding. Um, the local authority are currently working through these the ch these changes, the impact of these changes to the top up rates um, on top of the work that's currently being done around the descriptors of need. Um, so we'll report back to forum in the April around what that means for um, special school top ups and working with working with the, with the special schools um, to, to, to update them on the mainstream schools and the ARPs. So we're aware that they're also experiencing um, cost pressures for supporting high needs children. Some of the funding for mainstream schools has been increased through the mainstream schools block funding formula increases and the proportionate increase that will then have on the national send budget. But the LA are also working to consider the impact um, on top ups for 23-24. So again, progress will be reported back to forum in the April on that. Um, as I mentioned at the start of the meeting, the schools forum agreed to continue the transfer of the 0.5% from the schools to the high needs block for 23-24. So that's a continuation of the um, agreement but that's been made for, I think, four or five years now. Um, and then just noting at the last meeting of the forum, the local authority reported the, um, the projected overspend on the high needs block of 1.536 million and a cumulative overspend of 2.683 million. So further works being um continuing on that to to reduce that including the application of the dsg reserves as agreed in the summer and um the local authority will report back to the april meeting of the forum um further on this so, the april meeting will, sorry the april meeting will be a may meeting oh yes sorry yes not an april meeting is it start of may this year no. normally an april meeting <laughs> final thing and uh, update on the forecast for school balances yep so um all maintained schools were asked to make a budget monitoring return in in december um and of the so um of the schools that had returned the forecast at the point when the report was written the 54 schools a few more have returned them since um six were forecasting they'll be in deficit at the end of 22 23 so that was three primary schools two special schools and one nursery school two of those were previously in surplus One's forecasting a reduced deficit and three are forecasting increasing deficits. Um, of those forecasting a, um, with a surplus balance, um, at the end of 21-22, more than three quarters of them are forecasting that a balance will have reduced by the end of 22-23, which is probably, I think, what we would expect based on the, on the, the pressures that schools are facing. Um, and the total forecasted balances across the 48 schools who, who had made a return and were forecast were in surplus then last year. Um, 
we're forecasting a surplus of 13.2 million, which is a just under 2 million reduction from the position at the end of 21-22. Um, so once we have the final balances, we will report back to forum the final position. But I thought it was helpful to report an update on the on the position as it stands at this stage. And I think that's a real credit to um, Kim and Tamara about sort of forward planning and trying to get ahead of these issues. So well done. Um, John? Yeah, can I just check about the clawback mechanism and when we're due to um, to revisit that as schools forum and whether we can have a look at the parameters for that for any excess, excess balances? Thanks, John. So at the last meeting of the forum, we agreed to bring back some options around the balance control mechanism to the April meeting, which is when we sent, set the funding um, kind of protocol mechanism for all schools for the financial year. Um, and the decision to, as to whether to apply the balance control mechanism or not would be made in the summer once the balances are available to schools um, for schools forum to review um, and understand the impact of applying the mechanism. Okay, so that pretty much brings us quite swiftly to the end of a cold winter nights meeting. Um, just a couple of things before we finish off. Um, is that okay with you guys? Yeah. Um, so um, this, unfortunately, will be the last minute for one of our esteemed colleagues, Charles Bernard. Um, so I'm going to thank Charles in a moment, but and give Charles a chance to say something if he wants, um, but just maybe pass over to Julie to talk about what's happening or not. Um, yes, I can't give you all the information at the moment, but um, just to say that the council has now appointed um, a strategic director for children's services. So the statutory director for children's services, um, a man called Robert uh, South, um, who is currently the Director of Children's Services in Havering. So he will be joining us sometime in early April. Uh, we haven't got the exact date yet. Um, and at, at the moment, um, Carolyn and I and others are working on a interim structure in children's services, um, obviously taking account of the changes and Charles moving on. Um, and we hope to to publish that um, in the next two weeks. We're just finalising that at the moment. Um, and that will be an interim structure subject to um, Robert's um, direction of travel as well. OK, so I just wanted to take this opportunity to say a big thank you to Charles. Um, I have to say, uh, just listening to Charles uh, talking earlier about um, the complexities around early years funding formula. Um, I'm going to miss that uh, insight and technical knowledge. Uh, it's uh, it's um, acquired over a number of years. Charles has worked in the authority for a long time and has certainly been here as nearly as long as I have, if not longer. <laughs> so we've been great colleagues and um, I certainly have valued Charles's support and his affability over the years um, and I know many of his colleagues in the authority will miss him but um, on to greater and better things and um, so I just want to say a big thank you to Charles for all his contributions to Schools Forum and wish him well in his new ventures Great. Thank you very much, Paul, and thank you. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure working in Eden. Um, I've, I've loved every moment, although some of those have been very challenging. Um, but I, I wish you all well in the work, and um, thank you for all your support over the years, and I won't keep you from your dinner. So thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, everybody.